Tell me if this sounds familiar. You decided to grab that big series off the shelf in the YA section of the library to see if it was any good. And right at the beginning, the story introduces some huge mysteries that get your mind wondering. You continue on, hoping to find answers to your questions, but if anything, the story only gets more mysterious, with each answer only raising new questions. And the mysteries keep piling up and piling up until your brain starts to hurt keeping track of it all, and you get to the end and you're like, help, I need someone to explain this to me. Fortunately, that's why I'm here. The Gone series is what I like to call a mystery box story. Definition on screen. And I've dedicated myself to explaining as many of them as possible. If you have unanswered questions about the convoluted lore of a story you've just finished, then I'm the guy who can give you those answers. Then afterwards, I give each mystery box story a rating out of 10, using my 10 criteria for what makes mysteries like these fun and engaging. In this video, I'm going to attempt to give a comprehensive explanation of every mystery in question you could possibly have about this story. I'll help you organize all those different half-remembered plot points swirling around in your mind into a coherent lore for everything that happens in these books. It's my mutant power, so to speak. So, let's explain Gone. Gone is a young adult series by Michael Grant. You might also know him as the co-writer of the Animorph series. You know, those books with the kid transforming into an animal on every cover that were in every school library but that most people never actually read? Or I don't know, maybe there's a massive Animorphs fan out there that I don't know about. Gone is a pretty successful series, with 9 books released over 11 years. But it's nowhere near the level of popularity as a lot of the bigger young adult series. I assume that a lot of my subscribers are going to skip this video because they haven't read them. Uh, hello to all you people new to the channel who are googling around for fan content about these books and stumbled onto this video. Welcome, and please consider sticking around and checking out my back catalog of videos where I do similar breakdowns of books and shows like Gone. The premise behind the Gone series is that a bunch of kids have been trapped in their hometown where all adults have disappeared. Sort of a modern day Lord of the Flies, but with the added complication of supernatural elements and mysterious lore. Let's see how much of that lore we can decode here. Since Gone is a book series, there isn't a ton in the way of visuals to show which is awkward because this is a video essay. I hope that future editor me can figure out a way to make this video visually interesting. Huh. That's what you're going with? You're being awfully cooperative. I figured you'd be really annoyed that I wanted to cover an obscure book series again. Alright, gift horses and mouths and whatnot. I'm not going to summarize every little thing that happens in the story, but I am going to talk about all the plot points that connect to the central mystery. I need to lay out all the information the books give us before I can piece it all together. So the story begins in the town of Perdido Beach, where suddenly, in an instant, all the adults disappear. As our teenage characters start looking around, they figure out that everyone aged 15 or older is gone. We meet our main character, Sam, a natural leader who's good in a crisis, and Astrid, a super smart girl he has a crush on. There are many, many other characters, but I don't have time to list them all. As the kids in town gradually come to understand this new world they live in with no adults, Sam, Astrid, and their friends do some investigating. They discover a giant impenetrable dome that now circles the entire town. And at the dead center of the dome is the town's nuclear power plant, the Phase. People in town had always been paranoid about the power plant. A few years back, it had a meltdown after being hit by a meteorite, giving the town the nickname Fallout Alley. This is the first in a series of clues that indicate something strange is going on at the plant. Soon we meet little Pete, Astrid's little brother who has severe autism. And when Pete gets upset and somehow seems to choke Sam with his mind, this leads to a discussion about the various mutant powers around town. Sam opens up about how sometime before all this happened, he discovered that he has an ability to shoot laser beams out of his hands. Between him, little Pete, some others, and some animals in the area all developing weird abilities, it's clear that something is mutating the life forms in town. Sam's mother works at Coates Academy, a fancy private school for troubled teens. All the Coates kids come to town, led by their charismatic leader, Kane. Kane establishes himself as the town's leader and seems to do a good job, but everyone is a little afraid of him and his lieutenant, Drake. Meanwhile, we learn some more about some kind of evil force lurking in the background. A character named Lana is captured by talking coyotes who work for a being they call the Darkness. Some kids turn 15 and then disappear, which makes everyone freak out. Both Sam and Kane have birthdays coming up very soon. Actually, they have the same birthday. Hmm. It turns out that Kane and Sam are twin brothers, separated at birth. Kane tries to capture Sam, but Sam escapes, 
and he burns Drake's arm off for good measure. But not long after, Drake goes down into a cave to meet the darkness, which grows Drake a new tentacle arm. Sam wins the war and kicks Kane out of town, and in the process, they discover how not to disappear when they turn 15. The darkness appears to them in the guise of their loved ones, and as long as you know it's a trap, you can reject it. And the final piece of the puzzle that we learn in Book 1, finding the power plant security cameras, we see that before the phase happened, the plant had a nuclear meltdown while Little Pete was there. Little Pete created the phase to stop the meltdown. On to Book 2, Hunger. Sam takes charge of town while Kane and his people are exiled back to Coates. In between books, Kane wandered out into the desert to meet the darkness and came back messed up. While Sam struggles to find his footing as leader, Kane makes plans. We don't know what the plans are for exactly until he makes his move, taking control of the power plant to seize the town power supply. But soon after he does it, Kane realizes that this plan wasn't really his. The darkness had planted the idea in his head because it wants the uranium as food. It also draws Lana to it to use her healing powers to make a body. The darkness calls itself the Gaia Phage, which if you know Greek, translates to World Eater. Not ominous at all. Once Astrid learns about all this, she starts theorizing. The accident at the power plant back in the day. The official story was that it was hit by a meteorite. But what if that meteorite had been carrying an extraterrestrial life form that feeds on radiation? Sam and Kane put aside their differences and fight off the Gaia Phage together. The Gaia Phage almost succeeds in forming a body and wiping out all life in the phase, but is defeated by Duck, who has the power to become infinitely dense and drops out on top of it. Yay! It's not fully gone though. Kane also kills Drake, who had betrayed him to serve the Gaia Phage. Book 3, Lies. A whole bunch of weird stuff rolls into town at once. A girl named Orse, who'd had the power to see people's dreams, has started to claim that she can see outside the dome. She and her friend Naretza, who nobody can remember ever seeing before, start encouraging kids to poof out of the phase when they turn 15. A girl named Brittany, who supposedly died in the last book, clawed her way out of her grave and disappeared. And people keep saying that they saw flashes of Drake in the night. We soon learn how people are seeing Drake. Drake is Brittany. It's like a Jekyll and Hyde thing. After Drake died, the Gaia Phage tied his life to Brittany's, and now they both share a body that can't die. Naretza is also a creation of the Gaia Phage, not a kid. The Gaia Phage made her by hijacking Little Pete's power and sent her to trick the kids into leaving the phase when they turn 15. And speaking of Little Pete, we learn that he sees this whole thing as a game of him against the Gaia Phage, with Pete directing and protecting the kids and the Gaia Phage trying to kill them. The Gaia Phage's plan in this book is to create chaos while Naretza manipulates Mary, the girl who runs the town daycare, into thinking that killing all the kids will allow them to escape from the phase. Thankfully, the others stop her. Book 4, Plague. The book opens with Little Pete having caught the titular plague. If Little Pete dies, the dome comes down, and the Gaia Phage is loose on the world. We jump to outside the phase to Sam's mother's point of view. This confirms that the world outside still exists. We also hear that the first few kids to turn 15 did make it out, but everyone after that came out horribly mangled. Drake slash Brittany had been captured in the last book, but Drake breaks out and goes back to the Gaia Phage. The Gaia Phage touches Brittany's mind and just info dumps the entire rest of its backstory. An alien race sent out a bunch of concoctions that create, evolve, and spread life. One of them crash landed on Earth, on the power plant, killing a power plant employee. The alien creation merged with nuclear energy and human DNA to create a monster that was able and willing to eat the world. The Gaia Phage sends an army of giant bugs to capture little Pete and steal his power to break out of the barrier. The kids fight them with the help of Kane, who has been off doing his own thing for a few books. Oh, by the way, Kane's girlfriend Diana is pregnant with Kane's baby. But it's not enough. The bugs close in, and in an act of desperation, Astrid throws Little Pete out a window, and his body disappears. The book ends with Little Pete's spirit, untethered from its physical form, looking over the face. Book 5. Fear. We begin by checking in on Sam's mom outside. Scientists have been testing the barrier, and it appears to be weakening. Inside, Sam and Astrid track a black stain spreading across the barrier that will leave the phase in total darkness. Little Pete is now basically a god, and he reaches down to play with some of the kids, mutating and killing them in the process. Sam's mom mentions that the power plant employee who died when the meteor hit was Sam and Kane's dad. The stain is creeping up along the barrier, making everything pitch black, and the Gaia Phage appears to be weakening, but it has a plan. While the kids are panicking about the lights going out, Drake and Brittany go to kidnap Diana to steal her unborn baby. Diana gives birth, and the Gaia Phage takes over the baby's body. As the book ends, the military sets off the nuke, 
but instead of breaking the barrier, it erases the black stain and makes the barrier transparent. So now, kids can see and interact with the outside world. Book 6. Light. The Gaia Phage Baby, just called Gaia, is on the loose. In short, there's a big battle, and Gaia kills a bunch of kids, but then, Kane offers up his body for Little Pete's spirit to take over, sacrificing himself. Gaia and Little Pete annihilate each other, the barrier comes down, and everyone's powers go away. And then it's over. The kids reunite with their families, happily ever after. Except there are more books. Book 7, Monster, takes place out in the world, after the phase, when more space rocks like the Gaia Phage rain down all over the globe. Various people get a hold of these rocks and develop new mutant powers, and the American government dug up what was left of the Gaia Phage, the Mother Rock, and used it to create more mutants of their own. One of those mutants is Dekka. I didn't mention her before, but she was a major character in the previous books, and she's the only real returning character here. Dekka and a bunch of new kids with powers get together and defeat bad mutants, including a revived Drake. They win, for now, but all the while, the mutants notice what feel like eyes watching them from another plane, just like the Gaia Phage did. The Dark Watchers, they call them. Over the next two books, Villain and Hero, these kids fight a bunch of other mutant threats. All the while, one of the kids, Malik, keeps trying to figure out what these Dark Watchers are. At the end of the last book, he and another mutant, Francis, who can travel fourth dimensionally, go and visit the Dark Watchers. It turns out that their world is a simulation, and the Dark Watchers are them, out in the real world, watching their simulated selves deal with these mutations. The book ends with the kids voting on whether to turn the simulation off, leaving their fate ambiguous. I should say that I'm not really a big fan of the last three books. The story of kids surviving within the phase was so exciting, and book six was such a clean ending. I feel like continuing the series after that cheapened what came before, and the new stuff is generally a lot less interesting. But they're part of the story, and I'm going to include them in the discussion. Okay, let's start answering some questions. First, what is the Gaia Phage exactly? We mostly covered this already, but let's go over it again. The Gaia Phage came to be when a race of aliens sent seeds of life on an asteroid across the cosmos. It wasn't supposed to be malevolent, but it crashed on Earth on top of the Perdido Beach nuclear power plant, killing Sam and Kane's dad and causing a meltdown. The seeds of life mixed with nuclear radiation and the human DNA of Sam and Kane's dad to create the Gaia Phage, the World Eater. Its only purpose is to consume and destroy everything around it. So once the Gaia Phage came to be, what was it trying to do? What were its plans? Real simply, it wants to eat the world. It lay dormant for many years, before finally waking up and beginning its conquest. But Little Pete saw this happening and created the barrier, trapping the Gaia Phage inside, preventing it from spreading. After that, the Gaia Phage needed to do three things. One, kill Little Pete so that the barrier would come down. Two, make itself a body. Because in its current form, a bunch of rocks at the bottom of a cave makes it really hard for it to do anything. Three, in the meantime, get some nuclear energy to eat, because without fuel, it'll eventually die. Across the entire series, the Gaia Phage accomplishes some of those goals. It repeatedly fails at trying to kill Little Pete, and eventually, the two of them kill each other in Book 6. It tries several different ways of getting a body. It tries to make Lana build her a body with her healing powers, but Lana breaks away just in time. It tries to trick Little Pete into making a body for it, with minimal success. All that does is make an avatar, Noretza, that can be controlled remotely. Finally, it succeeds in getting a body by stealing and taking over Diana and Kane's baby. While it's trying to make a body, the Gaia Phage is also trying to get radiation to keep it alive in the meantime. In Book 2, it tries to get Kane to bring it power cores from the power plant, but that doesn't work. By Book 5, it's run out of energy and is starting to die, which causes the black stain to spread. Eventually, it would have died, and Little Pete would have let the barrier come down, but the military nuked the dome and saved its life. By the time the Gaia Phage takes the baby's body and is reborn as Gaia, it doesn't need radiation anymore. Next, how do the mutant powers work, and where do they come from? It's important to note that the mutations started long before the Phage. The Gaia Phage naturally mutates lifeforms nearby. In fact, the Phage has almost nothing to do with the Gaia Phage. It was all Little Pete and his mutant powers. He got scared, and without understanding what he was doing, he teleported all the noisy adults away and erected a prison to trap the Gaia Phage inside. The books keep using the term mutants, but that isn't really accurate. Yes, the DNA of these kids and animals have been changed, but these changes aren't permanent. Diana describes the mutations as a cell signal connected to the Gaia Phage. A stronger connection means more dramatic mutations. And at the end, when the Gaia Phage is defeated, all the mutations go away. By the way, it's implied that this is why Sam and Kane have the strongest powers. Their father's DNA is in the Gaia Phage, giving them a stronger connection. 
what exactly happens when kids turn 15? The basic gist is that once you become 15, in Little Pete's eyes, you're no longer a kid, so he boots you out. Theoretically, you would come out unharmed like all the adults were. But during this process, you're vulnerable to the guy of age's influence. It blocks the way and appears to you in the guise of someone you love, and if you reach out to it, it tears you to pieces. So your only options are to stay in the phase or get killed. The first people to turn 15, Anna and Emma, seem to get out unharmed, probably because the guy of age didn't realize it was going to happen. But for everybody else, it was ready. So Benno, Andrew, Francis, Mary, it killed them all. Here's where things get a little weird. This is usually not something that I have to deal with in mystery box stories, but this series has a tendency to retcon things once in a while. It's usually small things, but it's still really annoying when trying to come up with definitive answers for everything. Like with what I just talked about, kids dying when they turn 15. The first time we see outside the barrier, we hear that after Anna and Emma, nobody else showed up. The kids who poofed afterwards apparently disappeared altogether. But in the next book, we hear that all those kids did reappear as dead mangled bodies. There are other retcons like this. Like in the first book, Astrid has a mutant power to see who will be important figures in the phase in the future. But this was dropped. Probably for the best, it was pretty dumb anyway. In the sequel series, Drake and Brittany come back to life because he regenerated from one tiny piece that didn't get destroyed. But they didn't die because their body was destroyed. They died because the Gaia phage died, and the mutation that kept their body immortal went away. And the biggest one, the simulation reveal at the end of the last book, feels like it doesn't fit with the idea of aliens setting the asteroids. You can probably justify these things if you really try, but it's clear to me that Michael Grant was playing a little fast and loose with the rules sometimes. I'm nitpicking, but I want to mention it in the interest of being thorough. The sequel series didn't have much more new mystery. It only had one big question. What are the Dark Watchers? I'll break down everything Malik learns at the end of the last book in some more detail. The world we've been reading about this whole time is a simulation. Out in the real world, Malik is a scientist. He and Shade created an AI that then created a realistic simulated version of the world based on their memories. They then added in all the alien mutant stuff to see what would happen, how people would react. There doesn't seem to be a specific reason why they made this, other than intellectual curiosity. That's pretty much everything. Finally, let's go over the timers. Across the first six books, each chapter has a timer, counting down to some major event that happens in the climax. Timer 1 counted down to Sam and Kane's 15th birthday. Timer 2 was the defeat of the Gaia Phage by Duck. Timer 3 was Mary's 15th birthday. Timer 4 was when Little Pete disappears after Astrid feeds him to the bugs. Timer 5 was when the military's nuke hit and made everything transparent. And Timer 6 was when the barrier came down. I really like how the timer functions in the first book. We start out wondering what the timer is for. Then as the story goes on, we slowly figure out that the end of the timer lines up with Sam's birthday. Then it builds anticipation as we wait to see what's going to happen. But after that, every other timer feels like it was just there out of obligation. They don't really add much. Those are the mysteries of the phase explained. But are those mysteries fun to read about? Are they satisfying? The story opens with a huge opening mystery when every adult disappears. This very quickly spirals out into several more questions when the characters discover the dome, mutant powers, and the Gaia phage. Every supernatural element of the story eventually ties back to the arrival of the Gaia phage and the effect it had on the world. These questions are presented as mysteries for the audience to wonder about until they're eventually explained. The story is plenty long. It's nine books, and those books are pretty hefty. There is not nearly enough mystery to carry through the whole story. The first book has tons of mystery in it. But once you get into books 2 and 3, you get a ton of new information on the Gaia Phage and Little Pete, which explains virtually everything important. And book 4 dumps a whole page detailing every bit of information about the Gaia Phage that you could possibly want to know. Books 5 and 6 have pretty much no mystery, and the sequel series only has that single question of the Dark Watchers. The mysteries are all part of the story world, and everything is solvable. The ending is one of those endings that explains too much. Honestly, too much is explained even before we get to the ending. Every mystery gets a straightforward and simple answer, leaving nothing to keep thinking about once you're done reading. The mysteries were not planned in advance. All the retcons I mentioned before make that clear. Plus, the story was clearly supposed to end on book 6 when the barrier came down, and the sequel series feels pretty stapled on after the fact. Finally, do the characters care about the mysteries as much as we do? Not really. Astrid cares. She's always researching and figuring out how this all works. But everyone else is way more concerned with staying alive. Sam doesn't need to understand what the Gaia Phage is or why it's trying to kill them, he just needs to kill it first. The Gone series isn't the best mystery box story. 
It's clear to me that the mystery elements weren't Michael Grant's main priority here. They were more a fun side thing to further draw people in. But that's the thing. The mysteries aren't the most important part. This video is all about the mysteries, but it really doesn't do justice how much fun this book is to read. This whole series is the most unputdownable thing I've ever read. The plot is constantly moving, the characters all have amazing emotional hooks, and you're on the edge of your seat the whole time wondering who will live and who will die. For me, the mystery was a cherry on top of a great story. I would have preferred it to have more of an impact overall, but I can't deny how good these books are. The Gone series gets a final mystery box rating of 6 out of 10.